This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Glenn Martinez from Olamana Gardens. And I want to share a few things with you. And one is, we used to do weddings at Olamana Gardens. Weddings, graduation parties, that sort of thing. We don't do that anymore. We're strictly into aquaponics and our horses now. But back in the day when we did do the weddings, I met some very interesting people. And one of the more interesting people that I met is a young lady that's with me today. And she was a minister with Methodist Church at the time. But this is Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Hello. Yeah. So... This is a special program today because this is all over the news. And sometimes you think, well, we're a gardening show. But I'll tell you what, when you're out in a gardening, in fact, on the farm, we have a joke that goes on. People say, wow, the farm is so peaceful. You know, all the animals and all of that. And we go, yeah, in between the rapes and the murders. And it's kind of a joke on a farm, you know, because sometimes the the farm is not all peaceful and all easygoing, right. nor is it with the people on a farm. We have college interns come. We have people from, we've done 28 different countries have come and trained at Olamana Gardens. And we've had people from 17 years old to 74 years old. And when you do that, you have a social problems. You have social issues that come right. up. And the one that you came to share with us today has come up for us as anybody who works with groups, particularly youth groups or mixed ages groups coming on, and it gets out of hand uh, to the point where we, we joke sometimes, we say, no couples, we're not doing any couples anymore, you know? <laughs> and, right. um, but Because couples are drama. That, that's sure. from, a, from a teacher's standpoint on the farm and that, and to sort it out, particularly if you have absolutely no social skills at sorting out or people <laughs> skill, it's even rougher. I'm better with the plants and the fish than I am with people. <laughs> but I wanted to talk to you about what your mission is. Can you tell us about what the mission you're on now? Well, one of the things that I, I, I've just come back from is a trip around the world. Mm -hmm. I was awarded a couple of very prestigious study abroad scholarships, mm -hmm. and I wrote my own independent study program, mm -hmm. and I went to 10 countries mm -hmm. during the spring semester. The title of my study was Domestic Violence and Child Abuse in Cross-Cultural Comparison. And mm -hmm. what I was doing was kind of looking at, you know, the different ways different countries mm -hmm. are dealing with these issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the great programs that I learned about um, was the White Ribbon Campaign. Mm -hmm. and um, I brought that back with me, and I'm trying to get it started here yeah. in Hawaii. Um, and I think there's a video that we can show that talks a little bit more about my trip and um, what the White Ribbon Campaign is. And then after that, maybe and we can talk a little bit more. This is kind of a trailer to a full-length movie that you're going that, to do, right? A full-length exactly documentary, right. right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. This yeah. is like the the little taste, the little teaser, so to speak, yeah, I like for that. the full-length one that's going to be coming out in the spring. Good and show. And just sort of give everybody a little idea, a little better idea anyway, of, of what my trip was all about. Good show. So do we roll that, please? In New Zealand, it's really interesting that Maori culture, there was no domestic violence present in their culture. But they are starting to work on programs that get the Maori back in touch with that original Maori culture that they have. And it was really exciting to see. There's a program called Man Up, which is really a neat program where they give these 12-week seminars to teach men to be better fathers, to be better husbands, and how to stand up to each other also. Hi there, my name is Nahirata Gardner. My role here at Awanui Arangi, Te Parewanao Awanui Arangi, is student support advisor. Um, a few years ago, there was one particular student and um, it was through referring them to counselling and really leaning on them that they both seek counselling help. I was right, right beside them because we can refer them but we're not too sure whether they're going there. So, you know, for, for that particular student there, I ensured that I followed that all the way through. They still work at their marriage. They have two beautiful children, but they are happy and the violence has stopped. 
And I said to my father, can I, can you take him home and have him stay with us? And he said, you know, we can't do that. There's no laws. You can't take children and have them stay with you. Oh, I said, we got to change that. And he said, well, you got to go out and get educated and do something about it. And I said, I will. safety of our children. Well, what we can do is we can put the safe place posters, cards, pamphlets, information in every church. Every woman can, can take a card, have the number of a helpline, the number of a counsellor, you know, all of the important numbers are there in every church to do that. Right. You know, it, it's just a source of information that's not necessarily going to solve the problem. Right. But it might give the person who needs it a lifeline at exactly right. the right moment right. or a telephone number at a crucial time right. when they need to call for help. I was really encouraged, just so you know, that people are really um, raising awareness levels everywhere in the world and laws are changing that further protect the victim and further punish the abusers. We're going to be starting a new program called the White Ribbon Campaign and that's we're going to be asking men to agree to wear a white ribbon and in putting that ribbon on, they're taking a pledge to not commit, condone, or keep silent about domestic violence or about violence against women and girls. Okay, you will not commit? We will not commit. Or condone? Or condone. Or keep silent? Or keep silent. About violence against women and girls? About, about violence against violence women and girls. girls. So help me God. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for listening. Well, that was quite an eye-opener. For myself, I sometimes think of a, the, when you think of domestic violence and that, I think of it as just an American thing, you know? Oh. Uh, <laughs> and many families have the uncle that nobody talks about kind of right. a thing, and it kind of gets hushed up, right. you know? And, and when somebody does kind of bring it up, temp temptation is say, you know, be quiet. It's just part of growing up, you know, your right. kid. Just you, know, right. just, you know, you don't ruin somebody's reputation and all that. You're just a kid right. and that. But I'm really interested in these white ribbons. And, okay, I'm going to ask you to wear one. Are you wear one? Yes, please. And when you put that on, you're agreeing to take oh, yeah. the pledge. And the pledge yeah. is that you will not commit, condone, or keep silent uh -huh. about violence against women and girls, which is the same pledge that we just saw the senators and the representative take. The white ribbon campaign started in Canada mm -hmm. in 1991. Mm -hmm. I learned about it in Geneva. So it's an international program. It's actually mm -hmm. all over the world, but it's not really in America for some reason. Mm. It's not anywhere in Hawaii at all. But it started all. in Canada, you said? It started in Canada in yeah. 1991. And you mentioned earlier that Canada has one of the lowest incidents? Of domestic, of domestic violence. violence, yes, right. Yeah. Um, they do, and there's a lot of reasons, I think, involved. The whole way they approach the legal mm -hmm. uh, system, there's not actual laws against domestic violence because it's just considered assault. <laughs> mm. There's mechanisms in place within those laws to help protect the victims from being, right. you know, put at further risk and all. Right. But so I think maybe that's why, because their mm. laws are so different and people are so different in Canada. It's not just that they're extra nice, which they are mm -hmm. <laughs> extra nice up there. Right. But the thing is that this program 
is all about getting men involved into the prevention part of domestic mm -hmm. violence. Because right now, it's still, you know, even up to the highest levels in our government, having issues our with, government? let's just push right. it away, oh, let's not get it, but right. just locker room right. talk, right. Right? right? And it's that good old boy thing that is, mm -hmm unfortunately, so perpetuating the, domestic violence. Right. So what are the boundaries? When you say d domestic violence, are you talking about just people being beat on? Are you talking about sexual things? What, what, what are the, well, the, what, how the broad is it? The definition of domestic violence is changing every day. Okay. And just recently, like when I was in Scotland, they were mm -hmm. changing the laws. While I was there, the law was mm -hmm. being changed and put into effect mm -hmm. to include emotional abuse and financial coercion also. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a broad spectrum of things that define domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, any kind of controlling behavior that limits someone's ability to um, have that independence and... So not necessarily just hitting somebody, but no. just financially. I was oh, emotionally right. abused right. for many, many years yeah. in my first marriage mm -hmm. when he wasn't able to control me anymore with that emotional abuse. Right. It turned to physical. Oh. He fractured my skull, put me in the hospital. Um, you know, and I know it sort of goes back to his own yeah. abuse when he was a kid. And right, right. sort of, it's that whole generational issue right. that happens. And until we start to break some of those patriarchal rules that right. men don't have to you know be held accountable yeah. until we break those rules we're not going to get any kind of measurable sustainable change right. and i'm really encouraged now with all the people that are coming forward with the me too campaign mm -hmm. and all of this other stuff right. that has just begun it's really amazing um mm -hmm. To not feel like I'm a, a voice crying in the wilderness anymore, because right, right. now there's lots of people right. that are right. um, out there mm -hmm. speaking their minds and sharing right. their stories. And yeah. just today, a couple of the senators have now um, entered in a whole new program in the Senate. To, this um, our local senator uh, here in Hawaii? No, no, this is the, the, national. the national in Washington, yeah. D.C. To yeah. not allow these guys like this, you know, the Roy Moores and the, yeah. the people like that. There's yeah. apparently there are two open, um, inappropriate sexual advance type things going on cases right now in the Senate. And... Yeah. Um, Against know, sitting senators. Against sitting senators. Two right, sitting right, senators right. have a suit against right, them right. as we speak. But because of the way it's set up, the, right. it's not set up for the victims. They don't get any support. They have to wait 90 days before they can even um, report it and go forward with any kind of legal um, what, recourse a for it. Like for a, that's exactly what they call it, a cooling off period. Yeah. Um, and then they make it so difficult for them to even try to go after the abuser yep. that most victims just say, forget mm -hmm. it. And yep. you know, they don't want to lose their job and or they don't want to you know, lose their life. And I see in our local news that uh, we're finally clearing the backlog of the sexual abuse kits, you know, to come into the rape kits, they call them, right? Right. We had like, tw I forget the number, it was like 1,200 of them. We right. cleared off four, 800 of them. And we have 400 more to go. But some of these things have languished way right. too long way too long and right. nothing happens until that report comes back right right so those victims are all sitting on the side just sitting there waiting not yep. able to do yep. anything but feel yep. shame yep. and all that stuff that yep. goes along with it yeah. but in reality there is healing on the other side yep. of the abuse for these people and i think that having abusers stand up and be accountable mm -hmm. goes a really long ways right. in helping these women to process it's kind of interesting it. because uh, somebody made a comment on the Moore thing or, over in Alabama that this happened a long time ago. I mean, right. like, let it go already. The guy was 32. She was 14. She was 16. And I love it. The guy says, I always ask their mothers, you know. <laughs> I just, just, I love how guys confess, you know. Right, <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah, say no more, right? But, but it, it's kind of ironic. Criminally, we can't do anything against him. But as somebody said, how do you set a senator in that you would likely have to start proceedings to remove him? Right. So to me, it's a big wake-up call. I think also um, on the that's on the sexual side. 
on the abuse side, what happened over there in that church in Texas yes. to come out that that young Air Force man, right. really, that he, they come out and they say, you know, normally a lot of this stuff is all hush-hush because the people right. are minors <clears> and that. <throat> and they said, he, he, he broke his kid's head. Oh, you know, he, he cracked his skull. Right. And he did a year in prison in the Air Force and then got a less than honorable discharge and is out, okay? Right. And, uh, and of course, the Air Force is now admitting they blew it. They forgot to tell the world yeah. that they had a domestic abuser, which would not be allowed to own guns. It's a pretty you big know, mistake. You never should have been able to allow a gun. <laughs> so the Air Force is, uh, is at least they're stoning up, saying we dropped the ball on this one. Yeah. So there's a whole wake-up call going on in people that we do it. Um, right. And here, I belong to different organizations here in the community. And all of a sudden, you find out somebody in your club is you know was a pedophile or that they did their time they served the time but now they're on that list what is right. that the sexual offenders right and registry uh, right the rest of their life right oh yes so so in a sense there is no statute of limitations and like Joe Moore you may not legally be able to do anything but right. we can stop him from being a senator I hope yeah. so I'm really concerned about that that um, so many people in the South are willing to look the other way oh, and yeah. put you know I've been saying they put party over country and now they're putting party over their own morals because there's no yep. way they can claim that they're christians right. and and allow or condone this kind of thing which right. is why the pledge is i will not right. commit condone or are. keep silent oh, thank you very much you yeah. about violence yeah. against women and girls right. it's such an important issue and yeah, so is. often these guys are able to get away with it. Like, and in the South, the good old boy syndrome is really, yep. really big. And I know this because I was a United Methodist yep. minister in the South for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I was a woman in the mm -hmm. pulpit. So yeah. some of my parishioners wouldn't even come to the church because I was a woman in the oh, pulpit, yeah. you know, yeah. and things like this. So um, there's that good old boy syndrome is really in place down there. For a lot of reasons yep. that they'll want to yep. protect yep. him because, like you said, oh, it happened a long time ago. You just let it go. That's right. Well, you know, they might have been willing to let it go. And yep. these girls have all said they were going to just let it go till mm -hmm. they found out this man was going to maybe go to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Senate. And then they felt compelled to That's say something. Much. Because he, a man like that, does not deserve to be there. That's right. And, you know, one and, of and the... Quite frankly, oh, I, think, I don't think they would have got an audience in Alabama. I don't think anybody would even take their case in Alabama against an Alabama sitting judge. Right. A little or no chance or something happened. Right. But when it stepped up to the national platform, all of a sudden they can't squash right. it quite so easy. Right. You know, and when the Washington exactly. Post picks it up or the New York Times picks it up, then it goes off. Right. And, and one of the oddity things I find about that whole story is they're coming out now uh, saying that people that worked with him said, oh, yes, he got banned from a mall because he was hanging around the teenagers and right. hustling teenagers. I mean, got banned from the mall. I mean, that's, and and then they talked right. to fellow workers. They said, well, the guy was a bit weird that way. Right. So everybody so, knew. Really, everybody knew. Right. And everybody, well, like, no harm's coming of it. And right. that's a tragedy. Uh, the, the Hollywood director, uh, Weiner, right. where girls are coming up saying, you know, they're in a room, and the guy comes into a room and that, and uh, masturbates or something just really weird and then leaves the room. Right. And she tells everybody in the morning, she does not keep her mouth shut. Right. And everybody says, oh, that's Harry. That's just, yeah. He's like, he's yeah. like that. Just, no worries, that's just everyone. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Yeah, so it's kind of like that director's casting couch that's thing has gone say, way right? too far, what people right. will do to go over, you know, to right. be around celebrity and power. Right. So yeah, it's, it's a come up to for it. So when you went to what was your, when you, what countries did you go to? Well, I started in New Zealand because we have mm -hmm. our sister campus there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to um, Te Karawananga, Olavo Nuiarangi. It's um, uh, for Windward College, Windward Community for College. UH. Yeah, we have a sister campus, mm -hmm. or sister college, I should say. Mm -hmm. It's a really wonderful tribal school oh. in Whakatani, New Zealand, in the North Island. Uh -huh. So I went and I spent 10 days with the people mm -hmm. there, sort of comparing what mm -hmm. um, what they're doing on their campus mm -hmm. compared to what we're doing on our campus here in Hawaii. Right. Um, and then I went to Western Europe. I went to Rome and took a train all mm -hmm. across Western Europe and then went to Scotland where I got to spend mm -hmm. a little time looking at my own yeah. uh, heritage. Um, yeah. I'm half Scottish, so 
And then I went from there to uh, Ireland and then Canada and then back home again. Fantastic. We'll take a little short break here and I want to talk to you about Ireland. Okay. Okay. Just <laughs> stay, stay with us. We'll be right back. Think Tech Hawaii. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Gordo the Techstar, the host of Hibachi Talk. Think, it, think Tech is important to me because I believe we bring very interesting topics and objective matter to the community. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in a campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech. We'll run during the month of November and you can help. Please donate what you can so that Think Tech Hawaii can continue to pr raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. I've already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send your tax deductible contribution by going to this website. Thanks for thinktech.causebox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech, Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, thank you, or mahalo, for your generosity. <laughs> Hi, welcome back. Now each week, we like to have a tool, because I'm a tool guy. Not quite Tim the tool guy, but the ladies in my life, Natalie and Liz, from time to time think that I should show more interest in jewelry, right? <laughs> I think they meant for them. But I went out and I tried to find something, so I bought one in black and I bought one in silver. One is American and the other one is metric. And this is so cool because this is a guy's tool, let me tell you. Have you ever wondered what the thread is of something? Well, you take this and you has the female and the male. So you can see what will thread in. And if it threads in easy, so cool, written legibly, where even my tired old eyes can read it, it tells me <laughs> what it is. So when I go into the store, I walk up and I see, I need an M818 metric bolt, right? Now that's if it's a bolt, if it's a nut, you thread it on. So if you come over here and it's a similar thing, if it threads on, it threads on nice and easy and no wobble, you then read it and say, oh, this one is an M215. And that's the size of it. So it's really cool. And I thought, you know, if you're gonna buy your ladies some jewelry, get them something <laughs> that's practical. You can wear it so many different places and it does sizes, you know. So it's kind of cool. And this gets actually used more than you would think in a shop when you're hunting for nuts and bolts and right. stop cross-threading things. Saves all repeat trips to the store. But back to your... That's very cool. You know what we didn't yep. do, though? We did not um, have you take the pledge. Really? Raise your right hand. Raise my right hand. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is my right I will, hand. Yeah. I will not commit. I will not commit. Or condone. Or condone. Or keep silent. Or keep silent. About violence against women and girls. Against violence against women and girls. There you go. Okay. Me That's the one. silent? Never. Never going to happen. <laughs> Never going to happen. <laughs> well, I think, you know, if we can just get men involved, we can really make some sustainable, mm -hmm. important changes. And mm -hmm. until we get men involved, we're not going to get the kind of changes that we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the hard parts is nobody wants to air their family's dirty laundry. Right. So that, that has been a problem for a long, long time. Right. The other one is, I think people are starting to learn that they have to pick when to speak up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like the more thing is when you say no, it's okay if you may talk small town, but you go up and big leave, you're gonna re you represent America. No, not yeah. you. Now they'll put it up. The other thing I found very strange is, that the people are speaking up. Sometimes if it's just a 16 or 17 year old little girl, it's a kid's word against an adult. Right. And they can make up stories and embellish stories and that. But then when you come up with somebody, a woman sitting there 50 years old, telling about the worst night of her life, right? right or why she didn't date for another five years or right. blah, blah, blah. Exactly. And, and the effect it had on her life. And tell you straight, no, it was wrong. I should have, I was told to shut up. You know, and some of them wanted to speak up. Right. But also back in that day when these things were happening, people were not quick to sue for this kind of stuff. Right. You didn't <clears throat> you didn't just go out there and, and throw it down. Well there were the no court. laws. There was no mechanisms in yep. place to bring yep. a lawsuit yep. against someone. Yep. Um I was molested as a child by my father mm -hmm. and I had blocked all memory of it mm -hmm. until I was thirty years old. Uh -oh. And I was involved in one of the first 
delayed discovery suits is what they're mm -hmm. called because of course you know that statute of limitations had long passed for oh, me. Right, right, right. But um, back in the early 80s, yeah. there was um, some suits that started coming out with that delayed discovery. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually won, which was really an amazing, mm -hmm. empowering feeling wow. to finally stand up and make was him he still alive accountable. And, yes, and, and he was. held accountable? Oh yeah, and he was held accountable and had yeah. to pay for my therapy. So, wow. Um, yeah, and but it was more any of, reconciliation out of it. No, I no. would not ever uh, reconcile with him ever. No. Yeah, it was hard enough for me to reconcile mm. with my mother, who was the non-protective parent. You know, like where were you, yeah. mom, to sit by and mm. and watch all this and let it happen? But you know, because I am a victim, mm -hmm. I should say a survivor. I should say, wait, a soldier, because the war's not over yet. Um, I that's where my passion comes from, right. and that's why I'm so. Um, driven to go mm -hmm. out and help as many people as I can. Mm -hmm. While I was working as a um, you know, United Methodist minister, my specialty was working with domestic violence victims and child abuse Whoa. victims. And so now that I'm back in school to get my social work mm -hmm. degree, I'll couple it with my pastoral license, I hope, to still so what, work. So what's your degree going to be in? It'll be social work. Oh, yeah. And I hope to be able to be a pastoral counselor, mm -hmm. working under mm -hmm. the umbrella of the Methodist Church mm -hmm. still, and mm -hmm. um, work one-on-one -on -one with domestic violence victims mm -hmm. and child abuse victims. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the, the people connect to you more because you were also victimized? Oh gosh, that, yes. The identity that, oh gosh, that, you yes. Know, otherwise people say, you don't know, don't tell me you know what I feel. How could you know what I feel? And you right. can honestly exactly. say, I do know what you well, feel. And right. it goes beyond that even. Yeah. Um, when I would go out on cases with mm -hmm. my mentor, who has mm -hmm. all the PhD degrees, yeah. stuff and things, right. all the book learning things, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I had nothing at the time. Yeah. I was just a nobody. Wow. Um, and all of the people, almost every single time, would just uh -huh. glom onto me before they knew my past, yeah, yeah. before they knew anything about my experience. They would uh -huh. just instantly connect to me right. and bond with me. And we'd be leaving. And the, my mentor would be like, how do they know? How does that how happen? How do you do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I want to thank you so much for coming today. I, I do take this place seriously. I hope you yep. do. Yes, please. Yep. And I'm going to leave yep. some with you because I want you to give them to, all, to all your male friends, please. I want everyone to wear it. Thank you. I want all of Hawaii to know that I am on it. I am bringing the White Ribbon Campaign here to Hawaii. I hope that all the men that are listening here today will pick up a white ribbon when they see one. They'll take that pledge to heart and they will start to make a difference for domestic violence and child abuse. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us here at Think Thank Tech Hawaii. You. And we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Good fun. Thanks.